Good evening. This is Professor Roosh once again, this time with more on our ancient alien hunters. It seems that many are cashing in on the alien hunt, uh, this with more outlandish truths and misinterpretation of the materials encountered. Before I start this, I once again want to make clear that I admire the research and theories proposed, for at the very least, they are taking us away from the outdated creator being storylines, that is, an all-powerful deity who creates the universe and gives special privileges to those who enslave themselves to him. Instead, a new myth is being created, more in tune with our understanding of the universe. The ancient alien proponents state that aliens from another planet came to Earth and genetically engineered us to be slaves. The other part of this shows how cults and religions evolve. The ancient alien hunters have their patriarchs like Van Doniken, their messiah, uh, Zachariah Stitchin, their sacred literature, the Chariot of the Gods and the Earth Chronicles, and so on, along with cult members who will not allow the facts to get in the way of the storyline. In any case, I want to begin this presentation by debunking the interpretations of two images. The first image is of Hanab Pakel, thought by Von Doniken in his sacred literature, Chariots of the Gods, to be a spaceman seated in a spaceship. Let me quote Von Doniken. The drawing was made in a temple in Copan. Could primitive imagination have produced anything so remarkably similar to a modern astronaut in his rocket? The strange markings at the foot of the drawing can only be, now let me quote Von Doniken again, can only be an indication of the flames and gases coming from the propulsion unit. To begin, Hanab Pakel was a Mayan king who dates to 603 through 683 of the current era. This is a death image with the king on his back, the sacrifice, if you will, who through his death renews the world, symbolized by the world tree growing out of his stomach. That is not a cockpit of a spaceship. By King Pakel's nose is a jade bead. Burial attendants placed a jade bead in the mouth of the dead person. This jade bead probably served uh, as a, a receptacle for the soul or food, an endless supply of corn, for the journey to that other place uh, to which we all go back. The lines at the bottom, contrary to Von Doniken, represent the stylized earth, which translates as black hole, from which the maw of death emerges to consume Pekel while the world tree symbolizes rebirth. Out of death comes life. This is a complex image, but it has nothing to do with spacemen or spaceships. This image is to be found at Palanque in southern Mexico, not Copan, a Mayan temple site in western Honduras, as stated by Andonican. The image of the tree of life emerging from death is a common theme in Mayan and Aztec art. It is even seen in Christian art with Jesse, the father of King David, on his back, and the tree of life springing forth, with Jesus often emerging from a mushroom at the top. See the mushroom in Christian art for those images. Let's compare this to another image uh, to get a better idea of the motifs involved. In this next image, we see on the right a Mayan human sacrifice of the post-classic period, somewhere around 1100 of the current era. Out of the sacrificial victim's chest, from which his heart has been removed, is growing a tree of life, in this case, a corn stalk. His heart was offered as sacrifice to the sun god. This image is from Piedras Negras in Guatemala. The image on the left is from the Codex Borgia, one of the very few pre-Columbian books not burned by the ignorant and thuggish Catholic priests coming into Mexico in the 16th century. This is a depiction of the first sacrifice of the Mayans. Rising from the victim's open belly is the tree of the middle place, the axis mundi, or the center of the universe, which in the beginning sprang from the body of the sacrificed cosmic earth goddess. Her name is Maize Stock Drinking Blood. She's also known as Nine Grass. This is the primal or first sacrifice after which all others are modeled. Here we see the goddess lying on the spines of a caiman, it's sort of like an alligator, representing the maw of death, as we saw in Hanab Pakel's uh, image. Into her body flow two streams of blood. 
and out of her body emerge two ears of corn, one yellow and one red. She is attended by Ma Kuil Chochitso, or five flowers on her right, and Quetzalcoatl on her left, both of whom have pierced the foreskin of their penis to produce the blood, for as Dracula said, blood is the life. As you can see, these are common images, but without understanding the symbols, one could, as has von Daniken and his continuers, confuse certain images with spacemen. Such confusion is noted in Sumerian and North American uh, Indian art as well. I might add, as an aside here, the Mayans, Toltec, and Aztecs had a religious tradition steeped in blood, in human sacrifice. For without the blood sacrifice, the sun would not rise. This shows, as with the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions, how human creativity can spawn horrendous practices. All have engaged in human sacrifice in the name of their respective gods. Now this next image has to do with the ancient alien contention of gene splicing, or the development of composite animals by ancient aliens. Now this image uh, comes from the Gate of Ishtar in Babylon and dates to the 6th century BC not 3000 BC as some have suggested. This image, the middle animal, is called a surush, an apparent mistranslation, but in any case the gate was built by order of King Nebuchadnezzar II on the north side of the city and dedicated to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. The gate was constructed of blue glazed tiles with alternating rows of surushes or dragons, lions, and uruks. According to the ancient alien hunters, this is a real beast, the product of gene splicing by aliens. Really? The images of the animals are symbolic, with the oryx, a bull, representing the moon, the lion representing the sun. The surish, on the other hand, represents a synthesis of serpent, the head and scaly body, which represents the moon, the bull, the horns, also representing the moon, but sometimes the sun, and the lion, uh, certainly with the forelegs, another sun sign, and the eagle, the hind legs, representing spirit. All these animals in their own way are gate guardians and not evidence of gene splicing or the misinterpretation of fossils. Here we see another gate guardian called a caribou, an Akkadian term for a winged guardian being of Assyria. This image was taken at the British Museum but originally this statue with five legs guarded the palace of Sargon at Khorizbad near Mosul in northern Iraq and was built by Sargon II between 717 and 707 BC. Caribou had the bodies of a sphinx or bull and the head of a human with the wings of an eagle. They originally guarded entrances to buildings. The ancient alien hunters have yet to suggest that this mythical being was part of the ancient gene splicing scenario. The Surush, as shown in the previous slide, is simply King Nebuchadnezzar II's rendition, again a composite of one of his gate guardians. The ancient alien hunters appear to be selective in choosing alien composites. Let me use the caribou to lead into another composite, and you might be surprised with this one. Now, there's a great deal of disagreement over the structure of the angelic hierarchy in the Christian tradition. But the best known was originally attributed to Dionysius the Areopagite, who was a member of the Areopagus, a high Greek court of justice. Scholars, however, have determined that this was a ploy by the Catholic Church to award this angelic rendering to a period around the time of Jesus uh, as they were fine-tuning and constructing their history. The angelic triad of angels, there's nine angels in total, have been assigned to an unknown writer of the 6th century of the current era, now known as Pseudo-Dionysius. In the first triad of angels are the seraphim, or firemakers, the closest angels to God. Seraphim means firemakers. These sixth-winged entities are most likely a direct reference to the Anamita Muscaria, uh, the holy mushroom. And you can see the Mushroom and Christian art book for examples of this. Next in the first triad are the Shurubim, who exist strictly to worship God and act as messengers, for they know all God's secrets. Now, Cherubim or Cherubs are not the same as Cupid or Amor or Eros. The name Cherubim comes from the Hebrew word Kerub, 
which means either fullness of knowledge or one who intercedes. The cherubim are the voice of divine wisdom, possessing a deep insight into God's secrets. They enlighten the lower level of angels as well. They emanate holiness through the universe in order to ensure the success of universal truths. Cherubim also function as charioteers to God and stand beside his throne. They also personify the winds. The name Cherubim is derived from the name Kurub, which is derived from Caribou, the image we just saw. The angels in Christianity are likewise composites molded from other traditions. Let's look at another composite. This image represents the creation from chaos, a myth of the Mextex Indians of Oaxaca, Mexico. The origin of the Mextec date back to around uh, 692 AD, although their ancestors had been in this region for many hundreds of years. These myths were gradually, uh, but not completely, taken over by the Aztecs in the early 16th century. This illustration depicts Talak Nahuake, a composite image, half man and half water. Time begins when Talak and his wife take human form and tame the chaos and they make a home on a cliff that they rise above the water. They have two sons, those are the two figures on the left, who play and who have wondrous powers. Across the top we see the creation of animal husbandry and the use of tobacco and mushrooms and so on. And the two boys pray that the earth can be freed of water so crops can be planted. The gods agree. This is only one of the creation myths of the Mextec. Water, necessary for irrigation, was a central concern from these ancient people, as it still is today. Using this composite, did the ancient aliens gene splice ancient humans with water? There are many, many composite images in mythic representations all over the world. I've already commented on the Egyptian tradition in a previous video. So the question is, which composites are the product of gene splicing by ancient aliens, and which are the product of the creative mind? How does one separate one from the other? So there you have it. No aliens, no gene splicing, just the creative human mind at work. Probably assisted by various mind-altering substances, as certainly depicted in the Christian art. One more comment on gene splicing. According to the ancient alien hunters, humans were gene spliced to produce a race of slaves to work in mines, to mine gold, and so on. Now understand this. If these aliens were smart enough to build spaceships and travel billions of miles, why gene splice humans to work for them? You have to feed them, you have to give them medical attention, you have to let them rest, listen to the whining and crying, they have to be guarded lest they rebel, and so on and so forth. Why not simply build a bunch of robots or machines to do their work? All I can say is, if gene splicing is true, that is, to build a race of slaves, these aliens are pretty dumb and stupid. Moreover, not once have the ancient alien hunters entertained the possibility that the myths and images, the gate guardians, tales of giants, gods in the sky are product of drug-induced hallucinations, a more reasonable possibility adequately mentioned in the ancient literature, rather than aliens from outer space. Now, I've taken the time to read the research on the ancient alien hunters it's time for them to consider the use of powerful, mind-altering drugs in the development of ancient myths and the construction of composite animals and so on. They also need to take the time to read Mandelker's The 2300 B.C. Event and Bond and Hemsel's A Sumerian Observation of the Kofos Impact Event. View my YouTube presentation, Sitchin's Corrupted Cosmology, for research that throws doubt all over the interpretation of the ancient alien hunters and their position on alien wars. Now next time I want to consider more of the interesting conclusions regarding alien artifacts, moons as artificial alien satellites, and the conspiracy theory promoted by the ancient alien hunters. Until next time.